Hello everyone. I hope you had a wonderful coffee break uh, on our main stage and you're all refreshed for the next talk, which will be presented by Victor Malik and will be about Linux tracing made simpler with BPF trace. So let's go, Victor, and please enjoy the talk. And uh, if you have any questions, leave it in the Q&A tab. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Let me share the slides. So hopefully you can hear me and you can see the slides. Okay, so uh, yeah, that's great. Thank, thanks for the uh, answers in chat. Okay, uh, so hey everyone, um, I'm Victor and I'm a software engineer at Red Hat. Uh, where I'm working uh, mostly on uh, stuff related to BPF technology in the Linux kernel. And one of the tools that I'm particularly working on is called BPF Trace, and that's what I will want to talk about today. Uh, so I will briefly present what BPF Trace is, what you can do with it, what it allows you to do. Uh, and then, uh, since BPF Trace was already presented here, by the way, uh, some two or three years ago, I will uh, concentrate on uh, the new stuff that has been added uh, in the recent years, so that you know uh, what's new in, in in this world. Okay, so let's let's start. What is BPF Trace? Uh, if I had to define with one sentence, I'd say that it's a BPF powered tracing tool for Linux. Now, what does this mean? Uh, so first of all, BPF Trace is a tool which allows you to do uh, live tracing of Linux kernel and also of, of user space binaries running on your Linux system, which means that live tracing means that you don't have to modify the kernel in any way uh, to do the tracing and you can do tracing of the kernel that is actually running without the need to stop it, without the need to debug it. You just uh, start with BPF Trace and it allows you to live trace whatever is running on your system. Uh, one of the great advantages of BPF Trace is that it comes with its own high-level tracing language, which allows you to define what you want to trace, how you want to trace it, and so on. And as the name suggests, uh, it uh, leverages the BPF technology uh, in the Linux kernel. Uh, I will briefly sh speak about uh, BPF technology in a while, so don't worry if, if you're not familiar with it. Uh, a great advantage of uh, BPF trace is that the tracing is very fast. And I mean that in both uh, both in terms of writing the program itself, because the language that it provides is, is quite simple and very expressive, and also in terms of execution, thanks to the usage of BPF technology. Uh, some of you may know some other uh, tracing programs or tracing tools such as SystemTap, F-Trace, or for instance, uh, very famous D-Trace for Solaris. Uh, so BPF Trace offers a very similar functionality to this. However, it has uh, some quite remarkable advantages over, over these tools. Uh, okay, so let's get into it. How does it work? And before I will uh, go into internals of BPF Trace, let's see an example. So let's say uh, you have a running system and you want to collect the number of syscalls uh, each process in your system is doing. Using BPF Trace, it's as simple as writing this simple script I will, I will uh, explain what parts of this script mean. So now let's just leave it as it is. And the output can look like this. It's a shortened, but uh, you can see that it prints us uh, for each process uh, on our system. It prints us the number of syscalls that it did during the time that this BPF trace script was running. This was running for some one second. And for instance, Pipewire made five, nearly 500 uh, syscalls during the time. Okay, so how does it work? Uh, let's start with what is BPF because that's the underlying technology under it. Uh, so BPF stands for, uh, or used to stand for extended Berkeley packet filter. However, uh, since it's not about packet filtering anymore or not only about packet filtering anymore, uh, it's not, it, it's, it's today, uh, it's really called BPF and no one is using the, the actual meaning or of, of the abbreviation before. And also the E is now uh, omitted because uh, the traditional old BPF is not used anymore. So what is it? It's uh, basically, it's an in-kernel virtual machine, which allows you to run custom programs inside a running kernel. Now, this may sound scary and it is. So there are some restrictions to, uh, on the programs. Uh, first of all, uh, these programs are written using uh, so-called BPF instructions, which are low-level instructions uh, that 
operate over some set of 12 registers. You have arithmetic operations, memory operations, and so on. And these operations, or these instructions are then just in time compiled to machine instructions once the BPF program is run. Uh, but since this is running in a live kernel and that could cause, of course, many problems, uh, there is a component called BPF verifier, which makes sure that uh, BPF programs are um, are safe to, to be executed. Uh, for instance, it checks uh, that the program cannot hang the kernel, so it has to terminate. Uh, it checks whether it cannot corrupt the kernel or crash it. So it checks it if the memory accesses are valid, if there are no null pointer references and, and so on. So uh, BPF trace uh, builds on BPF and what it, what it can actually do. So BPF trace does basically two main things. First of all, it provides a a uh, very uh, high-level C-like language, which allows you to uh, define what you want to trace. And BPF trace uh, takes this uh, this script that you write and translates it into a BPF program, into BPF instructions. So this is the second part of our script highlighted in red, uh, which says that we want to create a, uh, a global map uh, which will be indexed by the name of a process. And uh, for each process, it will uh, contain the number of syscalls that were called. And second thing, BPF trace can take your BPF program and attach it to various events in kernel. So for instance, uh, we attach this program to uh, a special place called trace point, which is uh, hit or executed every time any syscall is entered. So this way, anytime a syscall is entered, uh, our program is executed and it collects uh, the numbers of these calls into a global map that 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 is just uh, printed at the end. Uh, as for the available events where you can hook, uh, besides these uh, special kernel trace points, which are static trace points built into the Linux kernel, uh, you can attach to uh, basically any function uh, inside the kernel or inside user space binaries. Uh, you can attach either to function entry or function exit typically, but there are ways to attach uh, basically to any instruction inside a function. Then there are very interesting hardware and software events, uh, for instance, uh, cache misses and so on. Uh, for instance, we have memory watch points, which means that you can attach to a, a single memory location and your probe fires anytime the memory location is accessed for read or for write. And also we have some time-based events, for instance, uh, for, uh, for example, you can run the BPF trace uh, script any uh, or every, I don't know, 10 milliseconds or so. So these are all the, uh, this is basically what BPF trace can do. Uh, before going more into detail, I would like to show you uh, some examples of some simple BPF trace scripts that will demonstrate the true BPF trace capabilities. So first of all, let's say we want to uh, collect uh, the number of bytes each, each process in our system is reading. For this, we can use this uh, simple BPF trace script, which we will attach. The first line is uh, says that we want to attach to the exit of the read syscall. The second line says that we want to filter only uh, those uh, syscalls that return a positive number, which means that they did not fail with some error, that they actually read some number of bytes. And the third line says that we want to build a global map, again, uh, indexed by the uh, name of the current process, which will contain for each process uh, some of the uh, return values of this trace uh, of the of the syscall, which means that uh, it's the sum of the bytes read by that uh, particular process. So running this can give us something like this. We can see here, for instance, system D during the time that this script was running read six kilobytes of of memory. Uh, another example attaching to the same uh, same uh, event, so to the exit of the read syscall, but now we uh, are filtering by the name of the process running. So we are uh, saying that we only want to trace uh, syscalls done by our application called my app. And what we want to collect is we want to collect a histogram of, uh, of the sizes that were read by this application. I can receive something like this, for instance, which shows that my application is doing quite a lot of one byte run uh, reads. Uh, so perhaps that could be a nice place for optimization. So this way you can very easily obtain quite useful information, for instance, about the syscalls that your application is doing. Uh, now, how does BPF trace work? I don't want to go much into detail, but some of you may be interested in how BPF trace works under the hood. So I have a very 
a simple overview of its architecture. It might seem a bit complicated, this, this picture, but I will go step by step to explain. So first of all, we start uh, with BPF Trace program, such as the one that we have already seen. Uh, at the beginning, BPF Trace uh, parses this program using a par uh, its, its uh, built-in parser, and as is uh, traditional with other parsers, for instance, in, in compilers, the result of parsing is an abstract syntax tree. Abstract syntax tree is basically a, a tree structure which contains uh, which represents the program and it contains information such as types and so on. After that, there are some passes run on this, such as semantic analysis and so on. I don't have it here, but what is more important is that then uh, BPF trace generates a so-called LLVM IR out of, out of this uh, abstract syntax tree. Uh, what is LLVM IR? LLVM IR is uh, the intermediate representation of the Clang LLVM compiler. So basically when Clang is compiling a C program, for instance, it will first compile it into its internal representation called LLVM IR, and then it will generate machine instructions out of it. So BPF trace uh, is generating this for our BPF trace uh, script. Why is it doing it? This is because Clang has a BPF backend, uh, meaning that Clang can take your uh, it can take your program written in, for instance, in LLVM IR and generate BPF instructions for you. So you don't have to write those uh, manually. Uh, by the way, this is the standard way of writing uh, BPF programs these days. So you write a program in, in either in C or, for instance, in LLVM IR, and you let Clang generate the BPF bytecode for you. Uh, so next, BPF bytecode is loaded into the BPF subsystem of the Linux kernel, where it is verified, and then it will be just in time compiled into machine instructions, and it is attached to uh, the event uh, that you want to attach it to. Uh, for us, it will be the chosen trace point, and then every time the trace point is hit, uh, our BPF program will be executed inside the kernel. Okay, hopefully this was uh, understandable. And if, if you have any questions, if you want to know more, feel free to go to, or ask me, or if you feel free to go to uh, the pages of BPF Trace. There's quite a nice reference guide, which explains a lot. Uh, okay, as I promised, I want to uh, give a bit insight into what is new in BPF Trace in, in recent days. Uh, so let's again start with, with a simple example. Uh, one of the problems that BPF Trace used to have is that the scripts used to be very complex. Even scripts doing some simple stuff can get quite complex. Uh, let's do this. Let's write a script which will check if a kernel is not losing any bytes sent over TCP. Uh, so how do we do this? We will attach to a kernel function called TCP send message, which has uh, three parameters. First one is a socket, which uh, it identifies the socket to send the data to. Second one is the message to send. And the third one is the size of the message. And it returns an integer, which is the number of bytes that were actually sent. So what we want to do here, we want to compare the size with the return value returned from this uh, function. And we want, we want to see if those two are uh, equal. And also uh, to make it more interesting, uh, let's say we want also uh, want to print the source IP address from which we are sending the data. We can extract this from the socket. Uh, struct sock has this information. It's, it's a bit deeper because struct sock contains a common and so common contains the address itself, but it's there and we can extract it. So traditionally, uh, writing this in BPF trace, you would use so-called K-props. Uh, K-props are quite an old mechanism in Linux kernel, which allow you to uh, attach to any place in any function inside the kernel. Unfortunately, what is a disadvantage of k-probes is that uh, their return variants, so when you're attaching to the uh, exit of a function, they don't have access to function arguments. So what, do you, what we want have to do here is we first have to uh, write a k-probe, an entry k-probe uh, is the first one, where we will store uh, the first and the third argument, so the socket and the size, because those we will need at the end of the function. Uh, the TID means that we are storing them per thread ID so that we can identify uh, when we are exiting in the same in the, in the same thread. And then the second part, the, the second K-probe is the more important, uh, or K-red probe, because it's hooked to the end of the TCP send message function. Uh, so that one will first uh, calculate or, or create the IP address or IP source IP address. 
how it does it, it will take the socket buffer that we stored in at the beginning. It's the SKTID part. Then it has to typecast it to the uh, to the appropriate type struct socket, uh, which we will pull from uh, from a header that you can see at the top. And then we will uh, access the appropriate fields to get the actual address, and we will send all these to the build to a built-in function in BPF trace called ntop, which will which takes an integer and translates it into a string representing the IPv4 address, for instance. Uh, then we will print everything to the user using printf, and then we will delete the entries in in our maps so that uh, again when we uh, execute the function uh, that there won't be some trash. Okay, so this is quite a long script, as you can see, for quite a simple thing. Uh, luckily, uh, BPF Trace has been recently updated with several uh, new uh, features, uh, which allow us to simplify this um, in a quite a good way. So first of all, instead of using K probes, we can use uh, so-called BPF tramplines. BPF tramplines are something that has been added to Linux kernel, and uh, they allow to attach BPF programs to various places, especially to entries and exits of, uh, of functions. One of the great advantages of BPF tramplines is that they have their written variant, so the one that you attach to the end of the function, has access to function arguments. So we can completely omit the first probe, uh, the first K probe, uh, the entry one, and we can also remove the delete parts, uh, and we are only left with the, with the return probe. Uh, second, BPF tramplines have access to something called BTF, uh, which is which stands for BPF type information. Um, and it's basically uh, debugging information for BPF. Uh, this gives us access to, uh, first of all, it gives us access to function arguments by name. So we, we can do arcs, uh, arrow, sk, so uh, to access the, the socket. And also it gives us uh, access to all data types that are there. So we don't have to include the header and we don't have to do the actual typecast. Everything can be pulled uh, in automatically. So instead of doing the original long script, we can be leave, left with something uh, as short as this, which is much more readable than it, it used to be before. So uh, this was done using two uh, technologies, uh, BPF uh, tramplines and BTF. Let me briefly explain what those are. So BPF tramplines uh, called kfunks in, in BPF trace are uh, a kernel's way of calling BPF programs with practically zero overhead. So they are even more efficient than original K probes because they have practically zero overhead. Uh, their advantages are, as I already mentioned, uh, their uh, return functions have access to function arguments. Uh, also, they have uh, access to arguments by name by uh, leveraging the BTF uh, type information. And uh, if there are some uh, kernel developers here, you may know these F F S F entry F exit trampolines from the Linux kernel. So this is the same thing basically. Uh, as for the BTF, which I have already mentioned, a BTF stands for BPF type information, and it's basically a metadata format to represent debugging information. It was originally mainly related to BPF stuff, but these days it contains uh, practically everything that you need to debug a kernel, starting from data types, ending with uh, function uh, prototypes, including names of arguments, and so on. Uh, it's usually generated from uh, dwarf Sorry debugging to information. Interrupt. Do you? Um, yep. uh, you have two minutes left to the Q and A. So uh, okay. Continue. Yep. Okay. We'll do. Uh, okay. So uh, BTF is general uh, generated using uh, payhole, uh, and its great advantage is it's is that it's very compact. Instead of two hundred megabytes of dwarf, uh, can be represented by only four megabytes of BTF. So uh, what main distributions these days do? They include BTF inside the kernel. Uh, and BTF gives us in BPF trace access to all kernel types without the need to pull in any kernel headers. Uh, now you may be asking, uh, okay, that's that's BTF, that's information for uh, kernel, but what about user space binaries? Uh, so recently, uh, dwarf support has been added to BPF trace. So BPF trace these days can also uh, 
trace user space binaries uh, and it can leverage dwarf if it is included in the binary so you can for instance access u probe u probes are a similar thing to k probes but for user space you can access u probe arguments by name uh, you can do automatic resolution of data types and many many more features that are either under active development these days or will will come in the future uh, one last uh, feature uh, that i want to mention is iterator probes uh, Yirka also already mentioned them today uh, at uh, some two hours ago at his talk. Uh, so basically the general idea is the, that BPF verifier doesn't allow you to do loops with unknown number of iterations. Uh, however, uh, you, uh, you can iterate some Google data safely. For instance, you can iterate a list of tasks, which is, which is always finite. So iterator probes allow you to do exactly that. Iterate uh, some kernel collections uh, safely and uh, write a BPF program that will allow you, for instance, to iterate tasks, as I have here on the uh, picture, and it can uh, you can print, for instance, the name and the, and the PID of the task. Uh, OK, I will just, uh, this, is, this is basically the last slide. I just want to mention two long-term future projects that we are working on in BPF Trace. First one is ahead of time compiled BPF programs, which are basically, uh, which will allow you to write your BPF trace program, compile it into a binary form, and then distribute that one. So there will be no dependence on LLVM on the final system. You, you don't need LLVM on the final system. It will be, of course, faster. And also, uh, it will, for instance, allow signing of programs, which can be quite nice. Second part is we want to implement uh, our custom BPF backend, which will completely replace the dependency uh, on Clang and LLVM. And it will allow us to generate a faster and better optimized uh, BPF code. Okay, that's it. That's everything from my presentation. Uh, thank you for being here. And should you have any questions, feel free to ask. Yep. Thank you, Victor, for your interesting topic. Um, I see that we have one question so far. Uh, it's from Yaroslav. Uh, mm -hmm. BPF looks awesome. What can it be used for? So uh, it can be used for practically anything you can think of. <laughs> if you want to uh, execute some uh, code inside a living kernel, uh, then uh, BPF is probably your way to go. However, these days uh, is, uh, first of all, it's, it's used for tracing, such as BPF trace, but there are other projects uh, such as libbpf tools and uh, BCC and so on. And second major uh, area where BPF is used is uh, networking where it is represented by mainly by the xdp project so if you want to see more about AI networking a search for xdp okay thank you for the answer uh other question is from jan so i don't need to need no debug info for tracing anymore right or what i need to install on my system for use it uh exactly you don't need the debug info package anymore uh, what you need to install, uh, you have to do uh, DNF install BPF trace, and that's it. That that's the way to go. Uh, everything other will uh, run out of box. If you have a reasonably recent kernel, you will also have BTF information built in, so you will have all these cool features that I have just presented. Okay, thank you. And last question, it seems, is from from Zbigniew. The replacement for LLVM uh, slash Clang. Will it be useful outside of BPF trace, for example, to generate system MD BPF filters for units? Um, so this is this is a very um, uh, we haven't started working on this feature that, that is just being discussed these days. But the general idea is yes, we, we would like to provide a, a library for this so it can be used outside of BPF trace. Okay, thank you. And another question popped up from Martin. Uh, what's missing in BPF compared to Dwarf? Um, so, uh, not sure exactly here. Uh, for instance, I know that Dwarf has uh, from Dwarf has uh, line informations about the source lines uh, from the original source. I'm not sure if BTF has that, but I would say that perhaps it already has or it will be added in future. If you're asking why BTF is so smaller than B uh, than Dwarf, this is because Dwarf contains a lot of duplicated data. So uh, it's it's all deduplicated and uh, represented in a more efficient way. That's why this is the main reason why BTF is so much smaller than Dwarf. Uh, however, there probably will be some uh, some missing information, but I'm not really sure which ones those are. 
Okay, and another one <laughs> from Yaroslav. Uh, if I want some simple tool for tracing single program for security, I think using VPF is the way to go. Is there any other option? System tab is a problematic because of the debug infos in needed. Uh, yep, exactly. Uh, BPF is, is your way to go, uh, either a BPF trace, if you want to do some uh, fast scripting uh, uh, for, or if you want to, yeah, if, if you want to do some fast scripting, if you want to do some more uh, complicated tracing, then either write more complicated BPF trace script or you, uh, scripts, or you can look into other uh, BPF tracing tools, such as, for instance, BCC, which is written in Python and is more suitable for large, uh, long maintenance projects. But yeah, BPF is your way to go. Okay, and last question is from Zbigniew. Uh, will we evolve Dwarf to be more like BPF? Uh, for example, less duplication? <laughs> this is not a question to me, this is a question to Dwarf developers. <laughs> Yeah, I agree in this one, and uh, we're uh, in the end of our time, but Victor uh, will be in our uh, virtual venue, work adventure. So if you have any questions which were not uh, answered or you just want to discuss this topic, because it seems it was really in, uh, interest, a lot of people are interested in this, just hop in the work adventure. Uh, there will be a link in the chat. So you can uh, go and talk with Victor about all of this. And thank you, Victor, for your talk. And I will see you in the next session.